So what happens within the Muslim world is, uh, is that suddenly all these people that were Marxists in the 1970s are becoming radical Islamists of the 1980s. I mean, quite literally, you know, and it, you, change your, uh, you change the vocabulary because it's very similar. Political slogans aren't that different. I mean, you could start shouting about uh, freedom uh, in Islam, or you can shout about freedom as a communist, and not a whole lot of difference. And so what happens is you get a lot of young people uh, coming into uh, these movements, these political movements, uh, that are basically emphasizing social justice. Very little emphasis on the uh, traditional teaching of Islam, which deals with three dimensions. There is a focus on one dimension, with it, which is Islam. And this is why you have a great deal of one-dimensional Islam in the Muslim world. The problem with focusing on one dimension, and particularly uh, the outward dimension, is religious people are very often unpleasant people to be around, right? That has been my experience. I'm, you know, my life on this planet, some of the worst people that I've ever been around are religious people and feeling much more comfortable with a secular humanist. Although I've been around some very rabid fundamentalist secular humanists as well, right? Because you get uh, both sides. But I think definitely within uh, you know, the, the, the religious tradition, there, the great danger of religion is religiosity, right? With uh, self-righteousness, with being judgmental, with suddenly, I'm right, you're all wrong. God's on my side, he's not on your side. This is a real trap for any practitioner of a, a religious teaching. And it is certainly a trap within the Islamic tradition, just as it is in every other tradition. It's, I, don't, I don't sense in any way that it was the, the spirit of the Prophet Muhammad's teaching. You know, I'll give you an example of one of the uh, tabi'in, second generation, to ask one of the sahaba. He said, we had a woman who died amongst us who di died without a mahram. And should we, in other words, a, she didn't have a relative. She was living alone. And he said, so should we wash her and bury her? And the man just said to her, you know, we didn't make things that difficult during the time of the prophets. A lot of them. In other words, bury the poor woman, you know, and give me a break, right? In, in other words, what happens is the spirit of the law gets lost with the letter of the law. And Islam is a tradition that really is trying to unify the idea of the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. That, that you cannot have one without the other. If there's too much justice, you end up with wrath. If there's too much mercy, you end up with a type of social chaos. So the Islamic teaching is trying to join these two. The problem with a modern Islam is there is a massive focus on wrath, on anger. And this is what would be termed in the Nietzschean worldview as the slave mentality of resentment. That the oppressed suddenly becomes, has a special status within human society because of the experience of suffering. I am suffering and you are not. Therefore, I am ipso facto better than you. Right? This is a real trap in, in the human psyche. You see, because you're not suffering the way I am, I'm better than you. And no moral superiority, no superiority of action, simply by the one fundamental issue of suffering. And this is a trap, and this is what uh, Roy Olivier says is the real crisis of the Muslim world, as as long as they stay in this framework, as long as they have this mentality, they can't, they can't pull themselves up. It's a completely disempowering condition to be in, you see.